Well, good morning. Uh, here we are from the pastor's study uh, this morning. I, I want to apologize. Our uh, feed this morning had some technical issues and uh, um, kind of got under the crunch as far as time-wise and weren't able to iron those out before our broadcast as well as it affected our recording software. Uh, so uh, you're, you get the round two, uh, round two from the pastor's study. So I encourage uh, or I hope that this is an encouragement to you as we spend some time in the Word uh, this afternoon. Uh, you know, just as we did in our service this morning, um, I think it's so important for us to acknowledge uh, some of the things that are happening in the world that we are uh, living in. You know, of course, uh, the fact that uh, many of us are not able to assemble together or we're beginning to assemble together as a result of what's going on and concern with the, uh, the pandemic. But then, too, what has uh, taken the, the headlines uh, as of recently is um, the turmoil that's in our nation in relation to um, uh, you know, what's happened in the light of uh, uh, unjust murder of African-American and then the responses uh, within our culture. You know, one of the things that we must acknowledge as we, we face this as people of faith is that we're all broken people, uh, all struggling uh, to make sense of the world and trying our best to, to make things right, but we can't. Only God can do that. So I think during this time as we see what's on the news, read what's in social media, and even look at ourselves in the mirror, we acknowledge that our only hope is in Jesus, uh, so to trust Him. So I'd like to just uh, have a time of prayer um, real quickly and uh, with us, and then we'll uh, focus on our message. Father, I thank you uh, for your grace towards us, and Lord, we acknowledge, as we've said already, we're broken, fallen people in need of your help. Lord, I know myself, I struggle struggle with selfishness, putting my needs above other people. Uh, just as I told someone the other day, you know, there's times where I feel superior. I feel maybe even entitled. But Lord, I know that's because of my heart is corrupt. Lord, our only hope is you. So, Father, we just pray, Lord, that you uh, speak to not only our hearts, but all people, that you'll call them to yourself, Lord, that they may trust you for salvation. Father, we are reminded in Scripture that if your people who are called by your name, and if we're a follower of Christ, that's indeed the truth, will humble themselves, turn from their sins, repent, and seek your face, that you'll hear from heaven and heal their land. And Lord, we pray for that. We pray for that healing. We pray for that peace that only, peace that only you can give. Father, we thank you that you hear our prayers. In Christ's name, amen. Well, this morning uh, in our service, uh, we had some great music. I'm sorry you're not able to hear it. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll get those things ironed out uh, for next week. Um, but this morning we are continuing in our sermon series in Galatians. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, grab a Bible, open an app, or do something. Uh, turn to uh, Galatians uh, chapter 1. If you joined us last week, uh, you remember we talked about the gospel. We talked about uh, being true to the gospel. As Paul was encouraging the Galatian believers, and I pray that you were encouraged as you watched or, or were able to be with us in person, uh, about what the real gospel brings transformation. And that if we were to embrace or to hear another gospel from someone else, that we are to, to stand opposition to it. We should uh, uh, stay away from it. Because as the scriptures tell us, if anyone comes preaching a gospel other than what's in the scripture, they're to be accursed. Uh, they stand outside of God. They stand as an enemy of God. Uh, so and then we kind of follow up with that this week as we look at Paul and we look at uh, what he has to say about the gospel in which he preaches. So again, in Galatians chapter 1, we'll be starting in, in verse 11 um, real quickly here. Uh, Galatians 1, 11 says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age and among many people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem or those who were apostles before me, but I went ahead into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And if we were to continue reading that, we would see um, 
in the following verses leading up to verse 24 that Paul just continues to, to help uh, his readers see that, you know, after this revelation from Christ, which we'll unpack, he retreated. He spent time at the feet of Jesus. He didn't consult other people. He didn't uh, learn from the traditions of others. But his truth, the message that he was sharing, uh, that, you know, obviously that we've embraced uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit here now centuries later, uh, was from Jesus and Jesus alone. So as we work through this passage, we're going to see really three things as we talk about the gospel of truth. First, we're going to see the gospel of Christ, uh, seen in 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12. We'll see the call of Christ. Uh, seen in verses 13 through 15, and then the commission of Christ. Now, granted, what we're going to acknowledge today is a lot of it is unique to Paul's life and the, the call that God has placed on him, uh, but it's definitely principles that uh, come into play when we think about our own journey. So thinking about the gospel of Christ, you know, from the onset, Paul makes it clear that the gospel was not an invention of man. Uh, he, he draws this contrast between this gospel that's been revealed to him and man's gospel. Uh, so as we think about this, uh, this message of hope is not from men, but from God himself. Uh, so he's, he's trying to make this contrast between man-made teachings and interpretations of Scripture and to uh, help them to see that Paul is not uh, dependent of that. In fact, he's independent of human teaching, but he's relying on the Lord and the truth that he has and what he's sharing with them. You know, as we see there in verse 16, as we noted, he goes, I did not immediately consult with anyone after this revelation. And I don't I don't get too far ahead of us, but again, Paul's trying to help us to understand, um, you know, what, what this really is. But let's think about this. You know, what is the man's gospel? What is man's gospel? You know, man's gospel, as anything that man creates, is man-centered, all right? You know, what can I do? What can I do to accomplish certain things and to bring about uh, transformation to my life? Uh, and indeed, the, the, the false teachers that, that Paul is encountering him here are Judaizers. Okay, They're ones that are steeped in their, uh, um, their Jewish faith, and they're taking that and then wanting basically to add Jesus to the mix. Or they're, you know, lack of better words here, or, the, or maybe the best way to say this, is they're adding more to Jesus. Again, um, a lot of that falling on themselves. What do I do? What do I do? So, you know, as we were to kind of boil it down to the essentials is, you know, I hope that whatever I do is good enough. Okay? If my good outweighs my bad, then I'm going to be okay. But there's no assurance in that. There's no real hope in that. You know, from a biblical perspective, as we look at it, we look at man's attempts at righteousness or man's attempts at right having a right relationship with God is... Um, you know, and Isaiah tells us that man's righteousness is like filthy rags. It's like garbage. All right. Um, you know, not too long ago, I cleaned my, my grill. All right. You know, I've had a lot of time to be at the house and all these different things. And, uh, you know, I've done some honeydew things. I've done some some uh, uh, projects I thought I'd never do. One of those is I rebuilt my grill. All right. And rebuilding, you know, there were certain pieces I was able to save and all this stuff. But I remember cleaning that and using a rag for part of it. And that was just a nasty rag when I got done. It was one of those you just throw away. I mean, there's no no redemptive purposes in that. There's nothing happening there. You're not going to save it. You know, just to think about that just for a moment. My righteousness, things that I do on my own, all of my good works in comparison to what God requires of us, is like filthy rags. My good stuff is like that rag that I use to clean my grill. It's not good for anything but to be thrown away. And that's man's gospel. That's that's man's approaches to God. We may think we have it all figured out, but we don't know for sure. And in fact, from a biblical perspective, it's not going to measure up. It's, it's, it's trash. It'll be burned up in the end. You know, not to be too polarizing here, but, you know, to, to look at it from a, a gospel perspective, as we think about other other world religions, you think about the Buddhist uh, perspective, you think about a, a Hindu perspective, which are heavily centered on karma and, and uh, following uh, the Eight Noble Path, if we think about Buddhism, but trying our best or trying their best to reach nirvana or salvation or paradise enlightenment to escape the cycle of life of death and rebirth death and rebirth and again not knowing for certain they can do it in fact they can't you think about judaism and you know 
hard uh, hold to the law and making sure you cro uh, cross all the T's, dot all the I's, and making sure you follow the law to nth degree to, to find approval. Think about Islam and just the, the pillars of faith and the moral code and trying to do all these things, but then in the end, you still don't know for sure if Allah is going to approve of you. That's man's, man's gospel, centered on what man does, what man can accomplish, but every aspect of it has no assurance. We don't know for sure we can do it. Can I tell you, it can't. Man's righteousness, man's works are like filthy rags. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. You know, C.S. Lewis was there uh, meeting with some other scholars, and they began to talk about other religions and made a roundtable discussion talking about, okay, what makes Christianity different? What makes the Christian faith, what makes the Christian gospel different than any other message that goes out in the world? And they went around and talked about, okay, the resurrection of Christ, okay. It's very distinctive, but at the same time, there have been other religions that have had resurrected leaders. Okay, what about the incarnation of Christ? Well, again, a unique, somewhat unique principle, but that's been seen too. It went round and round, and C.S. Lewis, you know, uh, kind of put a pause to it all and said, it's grace. The fact of the matter is, the real gospel is not centered on what man does. Our salvation, our hope, is not centered on what we can do, but it's centered on the grace of Christ, as we'll see as we work through Paul's story. So Paul, this gospel he has, does not come from a man, but comes from Jesus himself, an offer of grace, an unmerited favor. God acts upon man, not man trying to act upon God and accomplish something, but God acting upon man and bringing hope. You know, as we work through uh, Paul's writings, we work through the gospel, and you know, as we understand things from a biblical perspective, that true gospel is centered in the, the work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And the hope that we have there. And then Christ ex being exalted to the Father's right hand and interceding for us. And then we think about the reality that Jesus is going to come back. He's going to return. And then the understanding that salvation is found in faith and in, and in Him alone. That faith comes as a gift from God. Not that we should boast about it. And we see in Ephesians 2. It's completely an act of grace from God, from His mercy. That's that true gospel of Christ. It's not something man created. It's not a interpretations or thoughts or whatever. It's God himself moving upon man and revealing himself uh, to them and helping man to see his need for God and then help him to see, okay, how can that need be met through Jesus Christ? So the gospel of Christ. Uh, this, this message was given to Paul, uh, not from a man, but from God himself. Let's think about the call of Christ. You know, those of you who have spent some time with us in person or live, you know, we've spent time talking about Paul's journey from being a persecutor of the church to the proclaimer of the church. You know, if you know his story, you know that he's least, the least likely to be a champion for Christ. You know, as I referred to in our service and those that may have joined us and may be watching this later, he was enemy number one. You know, he was breathing murderous threats. He was taking people off to prison. You know, when they were there uh, uh, stoning Stephen, that very first Christian martyr, as we see in Acts chapter 8, Paul's there saying, yeah, go get him. You know, this is it. He's approving of it. Then we see he's on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians. And that's when he meets Jesus. That's when he receives this call, when he receives this gospel. Now, again, think about it. Paul, and as he shares with us here, here in this passage, you know, in verse, uh, we go back to verse 13. As you heard in my former life in Judaism, as I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it, so he's enemy number one of the early church. I was advancing in Judaism beyond all or many of my own age beyond, among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. As we see other parts of Paul's writing, he kind of helps see helps us see his resume in Judaism and how he was, you know, lack of better words, he was a number one prospect. I mean, this guy was rising. And part of that was anchored in how he was responding to this this cult in Judaism of those that were following Jesus of Nazareth, and he was going after him hard. Number one enemy. But he meets Jesus. And Jesus changes everything. He takes him from being a persecutor, a murderer, if you will, to being a proclaimer of the faith. In fact, as we know Paul's stories, the first uh, missionaries, uh, he's, he wrote most of the New Testament under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, just a real champion of the faith. 
But if you were to make a list, okay, first century and say, okay, here's all these guys. Who is most likely to become a follower of Christ? Right, Paul's name on the list, uh, or who's most who's not going to become a follower of Christ? I'll get that right in a moment. You know, uh, who is least likely to become a follower of Christ? And if Paul's name on that list, he's going to be chosen every time because he was the one that everyone saw as being enemy number one. But yet he's the one that becomes a champion for Christ. Again, pointing to the fact that God's the one that moved upon him in mercy and grace, as we see in this passage. And God's the one that deserves all the glory. Not Paul's accolades and, oh, yeah, he did this and that. No, it's a great fit. No, he was enemy number one. And God rescued him and uses him for his glory. So, again, moving on, we see here uh, he was set apart from birth. As we think about Paul's call and this transformation, again, looking back at our passage uh, in verse 15, it says, But when he who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. Think about that just for a moment. Paul was set apart before birth. You know, before he uh, came into this world physically, before he, he made that first cry out uh, for his mother or a first cry as he came out of the womb, he was already set aside for God's divine purposes. God had a plan for him. You know, there's something to be said about that. You know, as we think about, um, you know, far, first of all, God's election. You know, how, how He calls people to Himself. You know, we see that begins early. You know, before we set foot on this earth, you know, God has a plan for His people. We see there that the sanctity of human life—that life begins long before, um, you know, that first cry in, into this world. You know, even Jeremiah talks about how, you know, as God's knitting us together in our mother's womb as he did for Jeremiah. You know, certainly there, when we think about Paul's life, there's certain some unique aspects, but there's general things to consider as well. You know, just as Paul is set aside, yes, for a certain mission as we see, but we're set aside. God knows that numbers of hair on our head when we finally show up. I mean, mine are thinning, but I mean, he knows them. He knows how many I used to have, how many I have, and how many I'll have in a few days at this rate. But he set us aside. That same one that set us aside is the one that calls to us for salvation. He's the one that moves upon us. We can try, but we won't reach it. Our righteousness is filthy rags. But as we see here in this passage, uh, God sets him aside and then he calls him by grace. So the call of Christ begins when we're set aside and then he calls us by his grace. Again, a focus there as we see it's not on man's work and what we accomplish, but God's unmerited favor to us. God calls him by grace. Not, wow, Paul, you've done a great job. I want you on my team. You're a number one prospect in Judaism. I'm trading for you and getting him over here on the Christian faith. No, it doesn't go that way. Paul sees him as an enemy. I mean, excuse me, Paul is an enemy, and God sees him as that enemy and then moves upon him in a powerful way through the power of the Holy Spirit, calls him by grace and makes him one of his children. He goes from being an enemy, which we all are, because of our sin, and God makes him a child of God because of his grace or through his grace. And that happens in Paul's life. And in Paul's life, we see that, that happens for a reason. There's a commission he receives from Christ. Christ was re revealed to Paul for a purpose. Again, looking back at our passage as we see here, uh, back in verse 15, but when he who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me, okay, a revelation of Christ to him, then the time was right in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Paul had a mission. God had a purpose for calling to him, setting him aside before birth, that he would be that apostle to the Gentiles those that are outside the Jewish faith. In other words, he would be an individual that will serve as a catalyst, as we saw you know, even with Philip and, and, and Peter and others, but serve as a, a, this massive catalyst to open the gospel to the rest of the world. And before it was you know, started with the Jews, as we see there in Scripture. But now it's open to all people, and Paul is that, that mouthpiece of God's truth. He's that, that individual that God uses to take the gospel uh, to the ends of the earth. And Paul was... Uh, received this revelation for that purpose. He was called. He was saved with a purpose. Paul was set aside before birth, as we said, but called to salvation later. You know, as we think about Paul's story, again, we're saying God set him aside before he was born. But then we know part of Paul's story. You know, 
He was, he was rising within Judaism. He was an enemy number one of Christianity. And then God called him. God allowed his journey to transpire up to a certain point. He allowed him to walk certain roads, to experience certain things, to bring him to a point that God was ready for him to be that ambassador, ready for him to be that apostle to the Gentiles. Guys, as we think about our own story, yes, there's uniqueness when we think about Paul's story, but thinking of our own you know, God moves and speaks to us and reveals himself to us for a purpose. Now, there's a special call on each one of our lives, whether you want to acknowledge that or not. God has a plan and purpose for each one of us. And that plan and purpose has been set in place before our first cry on this earth. And as we see in Paul here, in order to prepare him for that role that God had designed him for, there's certain things Paul had to experience. He was called before birth. Excuse me, he was set aside before birth that he was called later. Now, as I think about my own journey and things that I've, I've gone through, things that I've experienced, the good, the bad, the ugly, all those things, God allowed those things to happen, wanted me to endure certain things, experience certain things, to make me into the man of faith that he's calling me to be. And so it is, as we think about it within the fellowship, men and women of faith are, are being transformed through life experiences to meet God's purposes. And it can be that for a while, God's plan is for us to be an enemy of His. But then there comes a day of salvation, as we saw it happen in Paul, a day that He calls to Him by grace. Now, because Paul had finally did enough good stuff and he'd earned it, no, he was an enemy. But God moved upon him in grace as we think about that. Think about your story. Even though some of the garbage we've allowed to happen, even though some of the things that we thought were righteous that were really just greasy rags, God still chooses to call to us, still chooses to use us. And that being said, as we think about Paul's life, think about ours, and John MacArthur notes this in his commentary, he says, God doesn't call anyone to salvation that he does not call to service. Paul's call is being set aside. All of it had a divine purpose, and that was to serve the church, to proclaim the gospel, to be a gospel uh, uh, apostle to the Gentiles. And so it is for you. If you're a follower of Christ, you're more than just a follower. You're a follower that's a servant of Christ that seeks to serve the kingdom by proclaiming who Jesus is. You know, this morning, as you watch this, uh, I pray that um, you've been encouraged, but I, I pray too that you, you ask yourself some questions. Have I embraced the true gospel? Or have I embraced man's gospel? Am I trying to do enough good stuff? Am I trying to make sure in the end I've done enough good, I've treated people the right way, and all those things are good, but you know what? It's all garbage. It'll never be enough. Because our righteousness is like filthy rags. The only hope that we have is by embracing the true gospel, which comes from the very heart of God, which is grounded in his mercy, grounded in his grace towards us. We don't deserve it. Paul didn't deserve it. He's enemy number one. But God called to him by grace and gave him a mission. For some of you, God has called to you. And you've embraced that hope. You've embraced that grace and repented in faith and believed in Christ and experienced a new life. Some of you need to. Some of you need to realize you can't do it. Scriptures make it clear all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. is eternal separation from God is hell. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We deserve death, but God in His grace, the true gospel, calls to us to believe. And then we can experience eternal life. As we think through that and understand that call to grace, the true gospel, the Bible also tells us that God demonstrated His love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the true gospel. 
Christ dies in our place. And if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Some of you this morning need to embrace the true gospel, to f- repent of the man's gospel, but embrace the true gospel. There's others of you that have realized, yes, I, I know I'm a follower of Christ. I've embraced the true gospel, but I'm struggling to understand what it is that God's plan and purpose for my life is. What is my gifting? How do I serve? Uh, I encourage you uh, this morning to, to be in prayer, uh, to, to, uh, to seek uh, the counsel of other believers to, to, to help you to see what it means that, that God is doing uh, in your life and how you can best serve Him. Guys, you know, it's, it's easy to, uh, to try to figure it out on our own, but hopefully you understand not too long down that road that it's empty. Our hope is only in Him. I encourage you today to make sure you're embracing the true gospel. If you are, you're called to be a herald of it, a proclaimer of it. You guys have a great week. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, we apologize that you're not able to see our, our service, uh, but hopefully this has been a blessing to you. Uh, next week, hopefully we'll be back uh, on track. Uh, but uh, if not, we'll make sure the gospel goes out from the hill. Take care. Have a great uh, rest of the week, and uh, we'll see you soon.